This story has a wild ending. It is worth sticking around for. But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please sneak into the like button's house and chain them to the bed while they're sleeping and then put on the far side of the room a very loud speaker and set it to play the song Boots 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 by Rudyard Kipling on repeat for at least 48 hours. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. someone who finds beauty in things that most other people consider to be pretty dark. But most Americans tend to associate the term goth with the teenagers of the late 90s and early 2000s that wore all black and wore heavy black boots and would hang out in cemeteries. And while that representation of goth culture is of course limited, it is a good representation of the two protagonists in today's story, best friends Rachel and Molly. In the 1990s, Rachel and Molly were full-blown goths. They had black hair, black makeup, black clothes, they had the black heavy combat boots, and at one point they and their other goth friends started hanging out in a cemetery to be kind of ironic and funny, like look at us, we're goth, we hang out in cemeteries. And then they actually enjoyed it and began hanging out in a cemetery like every weekend. One Friday night, Molly calls Rachel to go hang out in the cemetery. And as it happened, Rachel was just sitting at home and she was bored out of her mind. And so the call came at a perfect time. And so Rachel's like, yeah, I'd love to go. So she flies downstairs and she sits on her front step and she's waiting for Molly to show up. And eventually Molly's car rolls down the street and Rachel immediately recognizes that Molly is the only one in the car. And Rachel, whenever she would go to the cemetery at night with Molly, they were always there with a group of at least four people. Even though they liked hanging out in the cemetery, they did recognize that it was a little bit creepy at night to be out there. And so they liked kind of rolling in a fairly big group. And so Rachel hops in the car and her first question to Molly is, where is everybody? Are they meeting us there? And Molly said, oh no, everybody else is either working or they're kind of hung over from the party from last night. So it's just us two, I hope that's okay. And at the time, Rachel actually in her head was like, no, I don't really want to do this anymore. But she was like, oh yeah, that's fine. Yeah, we'll, we'll just go, just the two of us, it'll be fine. Molly takes off from Rachel's house and she makes the familiar kind of winding commute to the front gate of this enormous cemetery that sits right in the center of town. They drive underneath this massive wrought iron gate that looks very medieval, very foreboding. It looks like it's out of a cheesy horror movie, this like cliche entrance to a cemetery. And so they go through there and they're on this road that stretches all the way down through the cemetery and basically splits it in two. On the left side, as you're driving in, was an area closest to town and also it butted up against a major public university. And then on this side of the cemetery, you had a bunch of residential houses that butted up against the side of the cemetery. And where Molly and Rachel and their crew liked to go was on the right side, all the way back in the corner, because there was a section that was kind of situated between these two hills where not only were they obscured from the cemetery road and the main road, once they were down in this little depression, there was also no houses that happened to look over that spot. So it was kind of like the hidden section of the cemetery. And there was also this big boulder that people sat on and a big tree you could lean up against. So that was their spot. So Molly drives in the gates, she heads down that road and she turns right onto a dead end road. She takes that down about a couple hundred meters till it dead ends and they park, and then the girls get out of the car, they light up cigarettes, and they walk down this hill that's just beyond where this dead end comes to an end. And so they walk down this hill and it brings them to this clearing where this big rock and tree is. Rachel hops up on the rock and she turns around, so she's facing back up the hill they just walked down, and Molly is right next to her on her right, leaning up against the tree. And for the next hour or so, they just crush cigarettes and talked about their various boyfriend drama and life drama and whatever else they wanted to talk about. After a while, the girls started to smell a bonfire. And from where they were sitting, 
they could see a hill in front of them and there was actually another hill over here. And so their view is pretty obscured out of this little valley they're in. So they can't see any fires anywhere. And so they assumed that what they're smelling was a fire coming from the other side of the cemetery because there's that huge university over there. And they knew sometimes the college kids would come onto the cemetery and they would light fires over there. And inevitably the police would get called and they would break up the fire because you're not allowed to have a fire on the cemetery. And whenever they did that, the police would actually make rounds around the entire cemetery. And historically, basically, if you were there hanging out, they would tell you to leave. And so they think, okay, this is probably a good time to leave because probably in the next 30 minutes to an hour, the police are gonna be here. They're gonna come over here, see our car, and they're gonna ask us what we're doing and we're gonna have to leave. So let's just, let's just leave now. So Rachel hops off the rock and the two of them begin meandering their way back up the hill towards the car. When they get about halfway up the hill, they notice to their right, something bright. Now, because they were higher up, they could actually see over the hill to their right. And what they were seeing was the top of a bonfire. So the girls take a couple more steps up the hill to gain some elevation to hopefully be able to see better down into where this fire is. But even when they're up almost at the top of the hill, that fire is too far down on the other side of that hill that they can't see any people and they can't really tell how big the fire is. They're just basically seeing the top flickers of it. Even though they don't know anything about the people over there at this fire, what they do know is when they showed up, there was no fire over there. They would have recognized it. So whoever's over there had to have shown up and built this fire while Rachel and Molly were down at the rock and tree which means there's a pretty good chance they didn't see Rachel and Molly. This is a pretty private area. Their car was parked a little bit off to the side of the trail. And so Molly picks up on this and she says to Rachel, hey, let's let's sneak back down and walk up their hill and, and look down and see who's here. I bet it's a bunch of college kids. It'll be funny to see what they're doing. But Rachel had a weird feeling about it. She's thinking to herself, if this is college kids, why would they have their bonfire this far away from campus? I mean, this is literally the farthest point away from the side of the cemetery that's close to their campus. If they're having a party over here, there's a good chance that anybody going to it is gonna to need to drive. And that just doesn't make sense if you can just walk to the other side of the campus and have a bonfire over there. And so Rachel is logically deducing that this is probably not college kids. But who else is having a bonfire in the secret section of the cemetery in the middle of the night? And Rachel's thinking that now if the police come here, they're definitely going to see us because we're so close to this bonfire. And so it's probably not a good idea to stick around much longer. But despite Rachel's hesitations, she is intrigued and she does want to see what's going on over there. So the two girls walk down the hill. They make it down to the rock and the tree. Then they turn left and they begin walking up this other hill, the hill that's going to bring them up to the spire. And so they only get a few few steps up this hill when they are suddenly hit with this disgusting putrid smell that just encompasses them and it makes them gag and they're covering their mouth and their nose and Rachel exclaims oh my god what is that and then as soon as she says it she realizes she was really loud and she's like and Molly's like and they both freeze wondering if the people on the other side of the hill have heard them and after a little bit of silence Molly's like you want to keep going? And Rachel's like, no, we got to go. Between the horrible smell that's obviously coming from this weird fire and the fact that Rachel basically just gave them away. And so for all we know, these people on the other side of this hill have heard us and now they're waiting for us to come over the edge. And it's gonna be really awkward if we suddenly crash their bonfire. Rachel, she's thinking about these things. And so she's like, let's go, we got to go. Molly's disappointed, but she gets it. And the two girls turn around and begin walking back. And so they walk past the tree and the rock on their left. They turn right and they're about to walk up the hill that's gonna bring them to their car when Rachel just turns around to look at the hill towards the fire where they were headed before. And standing at the top of that hill is a man just looking down at them. And the fire is illuminating him from behind and they can clearly tell it's a man standing there looking at them. And immediately the girls felt really uncomfortable. It was almost like they had just been caught spying even though they didn't actually get caught spying, it was what they were gonna go do. And so they felt like they had almost been caught red-handed. And so Molly and Rachel just turn and begin walking up the hill, kind of with their heads down. They just felt kind of awkward. And so they move a few more steps up this hill and Rachel looks again at where this guy was standing and he's now gone. And Rachel's relieved, but then she realizes he's gone because he's walking, power walking down the hill towards them. 
And Rachel gasps and she grabs Molly and pushes her and says, go, 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 go. And they start running up the hill and Rachel looks around and now this guy is running towards them. He's down now at the rock and the tree. He's gaining on them. They sprint up over the top. They run to Molly's car and Molly's fumbling with her keys to get the car open and Rachel's yelling, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Finally, she gets it open and they both jump inside. Rachel locks the car doors. And as Molly is turning the key over, Rachel's looking out the back and she's waiting to see this guy. And sure enough, as they pull off, she sees his head come up over the ridge line just enough that he can clearly see them leaving and then he ducks back down and he disappears. And the two of them speed down the road, they make a left onto that main drive and they speed out of the cemetery. For the first few minutes of their drive, neither of them say anything. This was just a very traumatic experience and it was also very confusing because they thought they were going over to spy on college kids having a bonfire and then they're hit with that horrible smell, like what was that horrible smell? And then they leave and there's this guy who did not look like he was a college kid. He looked like he was probably in his 40s. And then he's chasing them. You know, like what was that? And when they did start talking about it, they couldn't really come to any sort of rational conclusion of what had just happened. And so they were both very spooked and they decide, let's just go home and talk about this tomorrow. And so Molly drops Rachel off at her house and Molly goes home and both girls go to bed. The next morning, Rachel gets up and she heads down to the kitchen where her mom is already there having her morning coffee. And Rachel sits down and you know, she's not a big talker. She's not about to start by saying, hey, guess what happened to me last night at the cemetery? Instead, she just sits there and for a little bit, her mom just kind of rambles about work and what she's doing that day. And then all of a sudden her mom, it's like she has this epiphany. And she goes, Rachel, Rachel, did you hear what happened last night? And Rachel's like, no, what? And her mom's like, someone I work with, I don't know her personally, but she works in the same building as me. She got kidnapped from the parking garage where I parked my car. I have seen her park her car in this lot and she got kidnapped. And Rachel's like, oh my God, really? Like what happened to her? Did they, did they find her? And her mom was like, yeah, but it was too late. The person who had kidnapped her had killed her and then tried to dispose of her body at the cemetery by burning her in a bonfire. Rachel suddenly felt sick because now she knew what was happening last night and she knows what that smell was. Rachel immediately pours her heart out about everything that happened the night before and her mom is totally horrified, but she's in particular horrified that they clearly had been there when the killer had arrived and set up shop and began burning this body. They were just literally 50 meters away the whole time. And so her mom tells her, you and Molly have to go to the police station and make a statement. They have not caught this person yet. You've seen this person, you gotta tell them. And so Rachel calls Molly and breaks the news about what was actually happening the night before and who was actually chasing them to their car and says, we have to go to the police station. And so they agree, they go down to the police station and they tell them what happened, but they didn't get a great look at him. They could only say that he was maybe in his forties and maybe average height. And so the police wrote it all down, but they basically said, look, if you can think of more details we would love to hear those because this isn't really enough to go on. And so the girls go back home and they're thinking to themselves, did he see us? Does he know that we saw him? Do you think he knows that we know he's a killer now? And so they're freaking out. But luckily within 48 hours, the police actually caught this guy because he was driving around in the murder victim's car and someone spotted him. Uh, they pulled him over and he confessed. And so he went to jail. Needless to say, Rachel and Molly thanked their lucky stars that when they started ascending that hill and they were hit with that smell, that Rachel said, let's not go any farther. Let's leave. Because had they continued and gone to the other side, they could have wound up in the bonfire too. So that's gonna do it guys. I hope you enjoyed today's story. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments what it is and tell us where you found it in the episode. Give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we will pin you at the top of the comment section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please sneak into the like button's house and chain them to the bed while they're sleeping and then put a speaker on the other side of the room and have it play the song Boots, Boots, Boots by Rudyard Kipling on repeat for 24 to 48 hours. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our three, four, even five weekly uploads. If you wanna get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's just John Ballin 416 I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.